share my screen. Make it big. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. Yeah, you are in presentation mode though. We see double. Um, ah, okay. Then, uh -huh. let me try to. You can just switch from the top, Elise, if you want. How do you? Oh. Uh, go back to presentation mode. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Anzeigenstellungen. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, exactly. This one. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I tried on Teams, but it was. I was not aware um, on how to do that on Zoom, but perfect. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Clara, for this introduction. And I'm super happy to be here with Tommaso to speak. Uh, today about building physics uh, from thermal side, from thermal to site energy with Tommaso. Um, Clara already introduced us, but I have like, you know, a little map of, uh, map of us. So Tommaso is from the New York office, has been working at Transola for 10 years. I'm uh, in the Munich office and I've been working at Transola for uh, four years now. And what I want to speak today about is actually about thermal comfort. So the very first question is actually, what is thermal comfort? And so um, comfort is very subjective, but it's actually when you don't want to change anything in the boundary condition of your space. So it's actually well-being of uh, your body, and it's a balance between the heat produced by your body and then the heat loss that you give to your surrounding. It's actually the minimum energy, it's the point at which a man can spend the minimum energy adjusting to his environment. So it's really what is thermal comfort and what we will we'll speak about uh, today. Parameter influencing comfort, there are really many and some of them are like subjective, are actually from the people and then other are objective parameter which are more um, like real metrics about the climate and so on. So you have the subjective parameters. You have um, like, of course, a bit of psychology in which condition the people are at a certain moment of time, but also uh, age and gender have an influence um, on the comfort. You also have the metabolic rate, which activity uh, you are doing at a specific moment. And of course, how many clothes you have on at the moment, if you have full overs or t-shirts. So these are like subjective parameters. It means it's like person parameter. But then you also have this objective parameter, which are climate parameters. You have surface temperature, you have air temperature, humidity, and also um, air speed. So these four parameters, they have impact, uh, objective impact on uh, the way you feel and perceive your comfort. Two of these parameters, air temperature and surface temperature, can be combined, and we will see later how and why, to kind of make another metric, which is called operative uh, temperature. So, but first of all, to understand like thermal comfort, we also have to understand a bit of um, like the body and uh, the physiology behind uh, thermal comfort. And that's why I want uh, to introduce you to the thermal balance of the body and to the terms PMV and PPD. So let's have a look at that. So actually, the heat balance of the human body is done by uh, exothermal reaction. Like in your body, you generate heat uh, by exothermal reaction and it is distributed by your blood. So if you have too much heat losses in your body, you will have a reduced blood circulation in your body. And so to counterbalance um, this uh, low blood circulation, you have, for instance, a shivering mechanism. So for, uh, in order to shiver, you have like your muscle that is contracting. And so by contracting your muscle cell, having muscle activation, then you will try to actually enhance your blood circulation and have more heat in your body. On the uh, other side, if you have too much heat generation 
in your body, you have more blood circulation in your body. So if you have too much heat generation, it can be caused by uh, like physical activity, for instance. And so you will have a skin temperature that is increased and you want to actually um, reject this heat from your body because it's too hot for you. You want to, to get rid of that. So for doing so, your body is also adapting with the sweating mechanism. So actually by sweating, you produce a bit, your, your body produces a bit of, of water at uh, your uh, body surface. And then um, with the air outside, it uh, make it evaporate. And then uh, the evaporation of, um, of this um, like water on your uh, skin surface, provides a cooling, like the adiabatic cooling. It can be up to like uh, 600 watt hour per kilogram uh, water you have on your body. So this reaction helps, uh, so this both reaction helps to actually uh, regulate your heat balance on your body. And so um, it has been actually uh, done by uh, a researcher in the 60s to link to all this parameter and it come up actually with the body comfort equation, which means you wanted to, to make, um, like to see the balance between like the heat produced in your body, link that to the heat loss in your body. And so by having that, you have this uh, body comfort equation. So actually your metabolism, what you have in your body is equal so what you produce, um, like the heat you produce in your body is equal to actually all the loss that you have in your body. So kind of loss you have uh, actually the activity that you're uh, doing at a specific moment. You have uh, the heat dissipation by convection, radiation and conduction. You have evaporation. So the mechanism we uh, spoke about like by sweating as a skin surface and also um, heat loss uh, by respiration. So sensible and latent uh, heat loss with the uh, respiration uh, mechanism of the body. And so actually this, um, this professor, the professor Fenger, he was a pioneer uh, in this field. So it kind of makes this body comfort equation, but then he also wanted to, like uh, represent that in a statistical uh, way. So actually, if the thermal component in a workplace is not perfect, how far from perfect it is, or within what limits should we maintain temperature and humidity and all other parameters to enable reasonable, reasonable thermal comfort? So actually the answer to this question can be obtained by the PMV index. So the PMV uh, is the predicted mean vote and it actually predicts the mean value of the subjective comfort rating of a group of people. So it's uh, the PMV scale, it's here, it's a, a seven point scale ranging from minus three, which is too cold to three, which is too hot, and when zero represent the thermal neutrality. So that means the thermal neutral sensation you actually have comfort. And so in, in order to, to have access to this result, like this professor Fenger made an experimentation. He had a large group of people, more than 1,500 people, and they have um, to be in a certain kind of uh, situation with uh, relates to one comfort level of the PMP scale. And then the people, the people doing the experiment have to state in which um, situation they feel if they were feeling like on the zero scale, um, one, two or three, like if they were too hot, too cold and so on. And so actually the predicted mean vote represents the comfort level of uh, the majority of the people. So it's actually a statistical tool to represent um, like um, the mean ID of comfort of people. So what you see is that this PMV scale is also linked to uh, the PPD. So PPD means a percentage of satisfied people. So actually what you see is that even though you have a very good predicted mean vote, like people are actually feeling well, 
then you see that you still have a percentage of people dissatisfied. Actually, you can never achieve um, like everybody is happy about their comfort. There's always a certain ratio of dissatisfied people. And that's what you see here on this uh, PPT graph. And by uh, linking all these equations, like the body, like the body equation, the body comfort equation, and then link to the statistical um, parameter that are like PMD and PTD, then it was um, like a, like demonstrated that there are like six parameters um, that are influencing comfort and influencing the predicted mean vote of a population. So which are air temperature, mean radiant temperature, air humidity, air speed, clothing factor, and physical activity. And what we want to achieve in all our design and in indoor and outdoor comfort is actually to have a kind of a good thermal comfort. So um, like a predicting mean vote decrease um, plus minus 0 0.5. And within this range, we are always at like 10% of people dissatisfied. So just to give you an overview on how and why we come up with these metrics and how they are linked to um, actually um, a statistical um, idea of, um, of the comfort of the people on a global scale. As someone has a question yes, or, or should I go on? Okay, I go on. You, you, you will have a lot of time at the end of the lecture to ask questions, I think we have continued for that. So yes, it's what I said, like we want to actually uh, design everything uh, like a comfort for people for PMV within plus minus 0 0.5 and PPD, so under 10%, which is what we see here. It is rated as being the best comfort and in a lot of standards, especially for instance, ASHRAE standards or the German standard that we will speak a bit about, um, they will also use um, this kind of, um, of uh, comfort uh, band. So now a few words about mean radiant temperature and operative temperature, because you've seen that uh, is what I told you before, like two main, two main parameters of uh, influencing comfort are air temperature and mean radiant temperature. And these two can be combined in like one only parameter, which is operative temperature. So we will uh, dig a bit into that uh, right now. So just a few words. So why is mean radiant temperature in the radiant environment super important for the people's comfort? So you can see, of course, that in the very complex equation from the professor Banger to make his statistical, um, like his statistical uh, calculation. But um, what we see is also that actually the metabolic heat production and dissipation um, of human body needs to be in balance. And you see that actually to be in balance, you have the heat emission by convection, which is what you see here at like outdoor temperature of, uh, which are consi considered to be comfortable. So between 18 and 30, you have heat emission by convection, which are equal to the emission, uh, the heat emission by radiation. And so it means that actually radiation has as much impact on your thermal balance that uh, the convection, convection is actually the heat exchange that you have with the air. So actually the air temperature and the, the radiation of the surface have the same impact uh, on your body to make you feel uh, comfortable or not. And it's what we will see right now. So what is mean radiant temperature? I think uh, you've been introduced to this concept in a previous lecture, but I will try to, um, to get that. The mean radiant temperature is actually the radiant environment for any point in a space. So what does this mean? Radiant environment is actually the temperature of the surface upon we can see and how much it can see. So for instance, if you have a look um, here on this example, so I am here, my point is here, 
And then I'm uh, surrounded by different kinds of walls with different uh, temperatures. So I have a wall with 40 degrees C, a wall with like 29, uh, a ground floor with 32 degrees C, and then an internal wall with like 29 degrees C. And then from my position, I do see all of this surface, and then they have an impact uh, on me. So the mean radiant temperature is actually the ponderation of the temperature and how much I can see of it. So for instance, here you have like the ponderation is done uh, like that. So I am I have like 360 degrees C. So I have to divide by 600, uh, not degrees C, but uh, degree angle. And so I see with uh, 65 degree, like a wall with 40 degree. I see with 120 degree, a wall with 29 degrees C and so on. And so if I do the additions divided by the whole, like the whole angle, then I got a mean radiant temperature of 32. So, you know, you see that at this point here, the impact of a surface that is 40, 29, 29, 32 is actually making a kind of, um, um, like um, it's equivalent to a box environment with only one surface temperature, which is 32 degrees C. And of course it can change if for instance, I'm like more near to my uh, very hot surface, then you know that I will have a bigger angle here. And so the impact of the 40 will be bigger. And so my mean radiant temperature of that point here will be bigger. And so that's why when we are uh, very near cold surfaces, we feel actually more cold um, than where we are when we are uh, much uh, further away. So it also has uh, a spatial distribution and that I, it is what I wanted uh, to highlight right now. So the concept of mean radiant temperature is this one. And then it's also linked to the operative temperature because like it's a bit um, difficult because uh, as I said, um, like people what they feel is actually half radiation, half convection, convection being air temperature. And that's why um, people come up with a new definition, a temperature, which is what people actually really feel. So it's the operative temperature and it's defined by the following formula. It's actually um, the air temperature plus the mean radiant temperature. So the mean temperature of all surface surrounding you divided by two. And so you can see that, that actually um, the same air temperature condition with different surface temperature. So here we have in both cases, 23 degrees C, but then on one case you have uh, very cold surfaces like 15 degrees C, mean radiant temperature. And then on another case, 29. And then you see that if you apply the formula to calculate the operative temperature, so really what people feel, what um, makes people comfortable or not. If you calculate it with the formula that we have here, it will be very different. Like we have on one case, 19 degrees C operative temperature. So 23 plus 15 is equal to 38 divided by two, 19. Same for um, the other case, it will be uh, 26 degrees C. And of course you will have a totally different perception of, um, of your environment. So in one case, you will be feeling too cold. On one case, you will be feeling too warm. And so that's why actually you always have to design not only with the air temperature, but also with the temperature of the surfaces. And it's actually what we want to achieve in all our buildings. So you can see here, this graph is maybe a bit complicated, but I will try to explain as good as possible. So it has been printed for a different mean radiant temperature. So mean radiant temperature 21, 22, 23, or for instance here 26. So for mean radiant temperature 26, and uh, the percentage of uh, dissatisfied people, so actually this PPD, like the PPD where we want to be at 5%. So the predicted percentage of dissatisfied people in our, um, according to the outdoor air temperature. And what you see is actually, if you have a very high mean radiant temperature, so from 26 
you actually only achieve um, like a good uh, predicted percentage of satisfied people, which means like 5% when you have um, temperature, air temperature actually quite low between 23 and 24 degrees C. On the contrary, if you have, if you manage to have a lower mean radiant temperature, so for instance, year 21, which is this blue curve, you see that you actually achieve, you can have a thermal comfort when it's like the air temperature is very high at higher temperatures. So it's actually what we try to do in our design. So the classical um, building design make it like that. So they design with very high uh, surface temperature because they don't care about shading and activating um, surfaces for cooling, for instance. So you have actually pretty high mean radiant temperature. And so it means that actually to be comfortable, you can only have air temperature at like 23, 25 degrees C. On the contrary, if you try to make like intelligent design with a lot of shading and having um, having a lower temperature on, on your surfaces because you have good shading and then you also activate some surfaces for cooling and not just doing uh, like point cooling, but surface cooling, then you can achieve this lower mean radiant temperature. And it means that actually with air temperature at 28 degrees C, you can be comfortable. And so that is actually what we want uh, to achieve. So the main message of, of that is that actually air temperature is not thermal comfort. What is really important is also the mean radiant environment. So the mean radiant temperature. A few words about a comfort standards because this whole um, study about the thermal balance and thermal comfort and which metrics influence comfort come up to, to standards and then um, standards that people have to follow when they are designing um, some new buildings. So here are two, two standards that we work a lot with. So there is a US standard, it's the ASHRAE 55 standard, and it's also based on a comfort level with a PMV PPD uh, within like uh, the, the comfort that we, we've seen before. So actually with PMV between plus minus 0 0.5, and so which means a percentage of dissatisfied people under 10%. And then they convey that into like the cycle chart in terms of humidity and air temperature. So actually they define two zones because it's a problem like predicting mean vote and percentage of people dissatisfied. It's a really great tool to represent statistically what is happening. But me as a person, I don't know. Like when I'm going outside, I can say, hmm, PMV is maybe here one or PPD will be 45%. I don't know. So they try to then backwards convey this, um, this statistical metrics into uh, like climate metrics so that people can uh, can relate to, to real metrics. So here in the ASHRAE, it's defined that the comfort is within this zone. So it's between um, 70 Fahrenheit degree and 80 Fahrenheit degree for specific uh, humidity for the winter. And then for the summer, uh, you can achieve a bit more. Um, it's still considered as comfortable with a bit more of temperature because it's considered that you have less clothes on. So on the winter, you have um, more clothes on. On the summer, you have less clothes on. And that's why uh, the, the range is a bit shifted. The summer range is this blue one here, but you also have uh, a summer range when you have elevated airspeed. So it's what we've seen. We also seen that uh, when you have um, higher uh, wind speed, so it means like elevated air airspeed because you have uh, like natural ventilation and you have a bit of draft into your building, or because you have uh, some ceiling span making uh, very low. Um, like uh, wind displace, displacement into your room. And so it has been seen that actually, if you have more wind speed into your room, you can tolerate much higher temperature. So it's actually uh, very important if you want to design with adaptive comfort. 
a few words about the German standard. It's also based on TMB TPD. It's also uh, based on uh, different categories. And the most used category is category two, where it's actually the same, um, the same comfort, um, the same comfort uh, zone as the one uh, for the US. It's also a percent, percentage of dissatisfied people under 10%. And the difference between the American and the German is that they state that into um, actually they convey this um, this range into operative temperature. So actually they define a kind of uh, comfort uh, zone that people have to achieve, but in terms of operative temperature. So it means that, like you see this chart, it's the outdoor temperature and the operative temperature. So it displays. Um, it states that actually you, you need to have a certain operative temperature when the outdoor temperature has a certain value in order to be comfortable. So for instance, uh, you see here it's winter. So because it's winter because you have temperature going to minus eight to like 16 degrees C. And then to be comfortable, you need to be between 20 and 24 degrees C. Then you have a transition period and then here you have summer and to be comfortable in summer, you need to be to have operative temperature between 24 and 28 degrees. So if all of um, your temperatures through the year are within this uh, band, you will be considered as comfortable. So a few more words on uh, the ASHRAE uh, standards and actually uh, with the climate and the question I asked myself because I was not uh, really aware of the climate uh, that you have there is, is it comfortable in Bulawayo if I do not condition my space? So here you can see the psychometric chart and you have one dot representing one hour. So actually it's uh, the meteorological data that you have here in Bulawayo when nothing is done, when you just go outside and Feel, I feel the weather and every dot is one hour. So for instance, here is an hour where I have like 28 degrees in and then a relative humidity, uh, uh, sorry, a humidity ratio of um, like 18 gram per kilogram. So you have 18 gram water per kilogram air. So what we see is that actually we want to have uh, most of the points uh, of the year in our comfort band. So everything in winter here, everything in summer, either here or here. And then what we see is that it's not uh, what we have. So actually in Bulawayo to be considered as comfortable in a building, you can just say, okay, I just have walls and I will like, you know, always open my windows and don't do anything, do not condition. Actually, it's not true if you want to be comfortable um, according to the ASHRAE standard, you have to do something. You actually, at some part of the year, so for instance, here, here it's winter because you have cool temperatures, you actually have to heat in order to be in this uh, good comfort range. This point here are summer, you actually have to cool down or actually, have a bit of air movement if you want to be considered as comfortable. And sometimes of the year, you're also considered to be too humid because you're more than uh, 12 gram um, water per kilogram air. And so you have to dehumidificate. So the conclusion is actually, no, if you do not condition your space, you're not comfortable uh, according to uh, the ASHRAE standard. It does, it does not mean that it's always bad and very uncomfortable, but if you want to build with the standards, then uh, it's not achieved. Just a few words on uh, what is relative and absolute humidity. So for instance, like this graphics, it states like, um, like the absolute humidity, so gram per kilogram, and also the relative humidity. So for instance, and it depends on temperature. So for instance, here on this two uh, situation, you have 10 gram per kilogram uh, water in the air. But because here your outside temperature is 13 degrees C, then actually you have your whole air that is saturated with water. So you have a relative humidity 
that you can read here. Here is not printed, but you can read it here. It's 100%. And it's fully saturated with water. On the contrary, here you have like 21 degrees C temperature, also absolute humidity of 10 degrees C, but your air is not saturated with water because you just have a relative humidity of 60%, uh, like you can read uh, that here uh, within the line. So it's just a few concepts. A few words about um, the standard, the German standard. The, so the German standard, it's made in terms of operative temperature. It's not done in terms of um, in terms of humidity, it's just done in terms of operative temperature. So, you know, radiant environment. So your mean radiant temperature, the temperature of the surface you have around you and then your air temperature. So it's combined into just one graph, which is here. So for instance, here, um, it's basically the results you can have if you have a condition space, you want, uh, you, you have to heat your building in, in winter to have uh, to achieve like uh, 20 degrees C at least during winter because you have minus 10 degrees outside. So, you know, if you don't do anything, you cannot be comfortable. And then the same in summer because you see you have like, uh, for instance, uh, 32 degrees C in summer. And then uh, if you don't do anything, uh, you will be like here, but then you condition the space to always be into the comfort band. So it's actually what you want to achieve. Like uh, I didn't say that, but like one dot uh, in your chart is one hour. And so you want to achieve like all the dots. So all the hours of the year to be within this uh, comfort uh, band. So you want to at some points pull your space and at some points heat your space in order to always be uh, within, within the comfort zone. So comfort is also um, actually related a lot in buildings to building physics and to materials because uh, like materials have different properties and then they uh, transmit um, and store heat not on um, not the same according to different materials. So a few words about building physics like two very important uh, characteristics of materials are thermal conductivity and heat capacity. So the thermal conductivity, it's uh, like the scientific, um, the scientific letter for that is uh, lambda, and the unit is watt per meter per Kelvin. And so actually the thermal conductivity, it characterizes the ability of a material to conduct heat by conduction. And it's actually like you can know that by reading uh, the, the units of um, this parameter, but it's actually how much thermal energy in one second, so what, is conducted in one square meter of material that has one meter thickness when the temperature difference between the two, the two phases of, um, of, the, of the wall is one Kelvin. So, it's actually thermal conductivity and the higher the thermal conductivity is, the more heat the material conducts. And the lower uh, the thermal conductivity is, the more insulated the product is. So this coefficient is also only valid for like solid uh, parameters, like solids, uh, not parameters, solid materials. And it's uh, not true for like heterogeneous uh, materials. And so this uh, property is like inherent to all materials. And then uh, when you're building with one, one material, you have to ask the manufacturer about its properties. And then uh, thermal conductivity will be one of the uh, properties that the manufacturer should um, give to you. Another very interesting um, property is like the heat capacity. So the heat capacity is called CP and it's in joule per Kelvin. And it's actually a measure on how much heat a material can store. So it's actually how much energy, so in joule, which is what we have here, is needed to increase the temperature of the material by one Kelvin. What we often use in, in like by describing materials is actually the specific heat capacity, which is the same, 
but uh, per, per kilogram, so in joule per Kelvin per kilogram, and also the thermal capacity, which is actually per cubic meter, which also takes into account like the density and how heavy the material is. So these two, um, these two parameters, thermal conductivity and heat capacity, are really important um, to describe the material and how um, how they can conduct heat and how they can store heat. Just a few words about um, like about thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and um, thermal capacity. You see that in the table for different kinds of materials. So you have concrete, like of course building materials, which is what uh, we care about. So you have concrete, gypsum, mineral wool, which is actually an insulation product, wood, and so on. And so you can see, for instance, that uh, in terms of thermal conductivity, if you compare like the concrete wall to insulation material, that the thermal conductivity is very different. Like you have two watt per meter per Kelvin for concrete, and then 0 0.04 watt per meter per Kelvin for mineral wool. So actually, what you see is that uh, like insulation material, so mineral wool is 50 times more insulating than a concrete wall. So it would mean that it makes no difference if you have like a wall 50 centimeter thick or uh, insulation of one centimeter, it will be the same for the term, like the, like the um, insulation properties of your material. So it's actually very important to have in mind because of course in buildings, you don't want to build like two meter uh, wide uh, walls and you, you would prefer to have like a thinner wall. So you prefer to have a bit of concrete and then a bit of insulation so that your, your walls are not that big and still have good um, like thermal properties and not uh, lose very uh, fast the heat that they have. If you want to look um, on the other uh, characteristic of the material, which is like heat capacity and thermal capacity, we can compare wood and concrete. It's actually uh, what we often do. So you see concrete and wood, they have like so different heat capacities and also different density, like we have very heavy materials like for concrete and very light materials for wood. And then it results in a thermal capacity. So in kilojoule per cubic meter per Kelvin of the material, which are really different. Like you see that actually, like the concrete can store twice as much um, heat than a, square, uh, a cubic meter of wood. And um, it's what it has been uh, observed. And what we often do is like when we want to store heat, we will more tend to build heavy buildings like with uh, concrete, bricks, stones, and so on, because they have a very good capacity to store heat. And so this idea of storage of heat, of course, it's not forever, but it's like it has the possibility to store heat. And then um, as soon as uh, the air temperature of the surrounding or like the radiant temperature of other like walls around uh, your wall are lower, then uh, your wall is starting releasing its heat. So it's a very powerful uh, concept because it can help you to, to reduce uh, the overheating and especially in summer. So um, actually, this concept of uh, thermal capacity is linked to uh, the concept of thermal mass and inertia. So thermal capacity is a physics property. And actually in the language, people will say thermal mass and thermal inertia. So thermal inertia is actually the ability of a material to store heat and release it gradually. So it's actually directly linked to the thermal capacity. And so it's what I said, it's very important to ensure that we have good comfort uh, in summer to avoid overheating. And it's based on two properties, like the um, building that have thermal mass and so good thermal inertia, and there's like a big uh, thermal capacity. They enable 
to limit the effect of uh, the temperature variation. So if you look at these graphs here, it's once for a building with low thermal inertia, so with like all the one walls having very low thermal capacity, and one with building with high thermal inertia. And so when you have low thermal inertia, your building reacts actually very fast to what's happening uh, outside. So here in blue, you have the external temperature. And actually, as soon as like the temperature outside rise, then it takes maybe one hour, two hours, but not much more Then in your building, it will have the same temperature because you cannot store um, any heat. On the contrary, if you have inertia, then uh, you can limit the effect of uh, this rapid variation of um, outside temperature in your inside building. So actually, it helps to shift um, to shift the peaks. So actually, you have the outdoor uh, peaks temperature during the daytime, and actually, you have the peaks uh, indoor temperature at the nighttime. So you have a bigger shift, like it's not taking like one or one hour to, to react, but maybe like four hours. And then you also have a, a damping um, of the amplitude of this variation. So it's a really uh, important concept when it comes to designing in climates where you have a very high uh, temperature and also very high uh, temperature variation between day and night. Building uh, buildings with um, thermal mass and materials that are heavy and have a uh, capacity, like big thermal capacity, sorry for that, then um, it will really help to reduce the overheating um, in this building. So it's a strategy that we really like to, to do in the region where you have um, overheating potential. And just to, to, to show you that, so just uh, some examples of simulations that we can, uh, we've done for uh, office room in Stuttgart. So you see, you have everything like low, um, low tech, like we just have natural ventilation, night cooling, a bit of ceiling fan, heating system. Yeah, and then on one hand, you have like a light ceiling and on the other case you have a concrete ceiling so a heavy ceiling and what you see in your results so if you remember it's uh, like the contour graph according to the german norm you can see every dots and you can see that actually when you have the light ceiling you have a lot of dots that are above your comfort zone so actually you have all these dots uh, which means that actually all these hours of the year that you are not uh, really comfortable. On the contrary, you can see that when you have a concrete ceiling, you have much less points and dots outside uh, the comfort band. So it actually highlights really the power of, of the mass because it really helps to reduce these peaks during the day. I can maybe a bit elaborate um, on the Kelvin hour. So actually, like here, you can also like count on how many hours you are above. Um, you are above the, um, the comfort band, but you can also quantify how far you are from the comfort. So for instance, and that's why we count the overheating, not only in hours, but in Kelvin hours. Just an example, for instance. For instance, here you see you have one dot, so one hour of the year but being just like 0 0.5 or one degree C, yes, one degree C above your comfort that you should have. So it's actually one hour times one Kelvin, it's one Kelvin hour. But here, like if you are like here, you are 32 degrees, but you should be 28. So you are, you are, it's still one hour of overheating, but with a very big difference, so four Kelvin difference. So four Kelvin times one hour makes four Kelvin hours. And so you do that for all the points, and then you sum everything, and then you can have access to this Kelvin hour overheating. So it's not only taking into account how many times you're not achieving, but how close or how far you are from reaching the target.
So you see the reduction is actually uh, drastical between the two examples with and without uh, thermal mass. You have 221 Kelvin hour overheating when you have a light ceiling and only 66 Kelvin hour when you have a concrete ceiling. So now we've done some um, building Elise. physics. Yes. Sorry, can I step in? Should yes, we do course. some time checking and what is going to happen in the next hour? Should mm -hmm. we have a break in, say, 10 minutes? Should we have some questions before we switch to the second part? Feels like we are a bit behind with time. That was just ah, a time okay. checking. No, no, no. Okay, Don't okay. get me wrong. Um, OK. Let's try uh, to finish your slides in, I would say, 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes. Uh, then we leave some questions, which I hope they're going to be a lot. Uh, then we take a break of five minutes and then we transition to the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Okay. Yes, perfect. Thank okay, you for, great. For that. You're welcome. I can see the hours, so I didn't really check the hours, but uh, okay, I will do that quick. If you remember the energy equation, I think it has been presented by uh, like on your first lecture. So here it's more about energy, like on your building, you uh, want to actually have thermal loads that are equals like the thermal load that you are giving to your building, so heating or cooling, that should be equals to like uh, what goes in and what goes out. So you have losses through ventilation, losses through infiltration, transmission, and then you have also gains uh, from people, equipment, and solar gains. If you remember, like we spoke about uh, thermal conductivity and actually thermal conductivity can help you to calculate uh, actually the transmission losses. So transmission losses is actually this part here. So um, you can calculate it with the formula that you have under here. So the transmission loss in what is actually the U value of the wall times the surface of the wall times the difference in temperature between inside and outside your wall. So it actually only takes into account conduction and uh, convection. So conduction is like uh, the uh, transfer of temperature through a solid and then convection is actually the air ex the exchange of your surface with the air. So U value is actually um, an intrinsic uh, parameter of uh, one wall and it can be calculated. So if uh, you have the thermal conductivity of your materials and then a wall being the sum of very different kinds of, um, of walls, you can uh, calculate the U values. Um, so the thermal um, transmittance of, uh, of your walls so is actually one divided by one divided by uh, the heat transfer coefficient of the inner surface. The same with the um, um, heat transfer coefficient of the outer surface, and then just the sum of um, the division from the thickness of the layer divided by the thermal conductivity. Uh, we often refer to U values, but some people refer to thermal resistance, which is actually the same uh, metric, but just backwards. So the thermal resistance R is like one divided by the U value. So just a very, very small example to make you understand uh, like um, how powerful um, like how can uh, thermal conductivity have an impact on the transmission losses? So for instance, if you have a concrete wall with 25 centimeter and uh, your concrete has like uh, this parameter, so this thermal conductivity, and then you know because uh, it has been uh, measured like the outer heat transfer coefficient and the inner heat transfer coefficient, it's values that are fixed and uh, are calculated for vertical surfaces, then you can actually uh, with the formulas that we've seen before, calculate the U value of your wall. So it's here one, because you just have one layer divided by one divided by inner heat transfer coefficient plus your um, thickness of your wall divided by uh, your thermal conductivity of your concrete, and then the same for the uh, outer heat uh, transfer coefficient. If you do the numerical application, you find a U value of 3.5 watt per square meter per Kelvin, which is actually pretty bad. And it's of course logical because you just have concrete and no insulating material. And we've seen that uh, concrete is not a very good insulating material. You can also calculate um, 
So this parameter is inherent to your wall, but then uh, if you want to see how it performs and how um, many heat loss you have when you have a specific uh, inside and outside temperature, so here outside minus five and inside 20 degrees C, you can use uh, the formulas that we've seen before. So it's actually the, um, the heat losses or the U values times the wall surface, 20 square meter, times the difference between inside and outside temperature. And what you see is that you have, you can calculate um, like that, the transmission of your wall, so 1,750 watts. So that much energy is going through your wall if you have this temperature difference. If you have now insulation, then you can recalculate again with the formula, but then you have to, of course, add uh, the physical properties of your insulation, and then you come up to a much better U value, actually 0 0.35 watt per square meter Kelvin. So you see it's 10 times uh, better than uh, the U value of the world without an insulation. And of course, because U value is 10 times better than uh, without insulation, then the transmission is 10 times better too. And just uh, as a reference, if you want to, to compare what it would be with like 45 centimeter concrete, because here we have 45 centimeter, um, like uh, 35 centimeters, sorry, uh, concrete, then you would see that actually the heat losses are also very big. So actually one centimeter is what we said before, like one centimeter insulation is not equal to one centimeter concrete in terms of uh, heat losses. Very quickly, uh, transmission losses uh, can be also not only done through uh, like walls, like solid walls, but also through glazing. And so for doing so, you have uh, values that are given by some manufacturer. You have like uh, one pane glazing, uh, two double pane glazing, double pane glazing with coating or triple pane glazing, and you have different kind of U values. These values, they are already calculated and given to you by the manufacturer. So, if you have like triple pen, you have of course a very uh, low U value. So very low U value mean very good insulation uh, properties. Your um, with the glazing, you have like losses through um, through it, but you also have gains because of uh, the solar gains. And so this parameter is determined by uh, the solar heat gain coefficient. It means how much of the solar energy can go through for your pain. And so it's different from uh, like the glazing you have. So it's also values that are given by, by the manufacturer. A bit worse, like if we want to continue into this uh, energy equation, like what are the internal gains? So you have two types of internal gains. You have the internal gains from the person, um, which are different if you are doing an activity or just seated. A very good value to keep in mind is like how, um, how much sensible and latent heat emission you have when you're just seated, it's like 75 and it's the same, like you have the same amount of latent and sensible emissions. So it's actually the heat that a people gives to its environment, but you also have like the internal gain that gives the equipment because the equipments are overheating. And so you have uh, for offices this kind of, um, this kind of gain, so phone and charger, or a lot more in offices with uh, screens and computers. So it's also uh, what you should uh, take as an input for um, calculating the gain that you have in your building. Last but not least, you still have losses through your building, not uh, only uh, through your walls with transmission, but also with your leakage. It happens because you have like, um, um, actually not very um, tight building. You always have like joints problems. So there are some, um, some air that can go through, um, that can go through uh, some of your uh, joints. So you have losses through that, which can be calculated with the following formula. And then uh, you also have loss uh, through ventilation because of course you want to ventilate your building, you want to have fresh air, but the outside air might be not as cool or warm as what you want to have uh, in the inside. So you always have to heat it or uh, cool it, and uh, it's a lot that you have. And then when you have all, um, all, all the heat losses and all the heat gains, 
then uh, you can uh, finally have uh, your energy balance and be able to calculate how much uh, heat and cool uh, you need to give to your building in order to have a comfortable system. I think that was it from uh, my side. I hope uh, we're able to, to follow it. I hope I didn't uh, took too much time for uh, explaining everything. Tommaso, what should we do? Should we do a break? We should have questions. Questions, questions, questions. Of course. I can see people, so please ask questions. I know that it was, it might have been a bit fast, um, I've tried to give examples, but um, I'm really happy to hear uh, questions. So, please raise hands. Okay, I have a question, which is, why do we need all of this? But I will try to answer in five minutes. <laughs> so should we take a break? Five minutes? Yes, five minutes me it's fine. Bio uh, biological uh, break so that we can refresh our drinks. Um, it's Friday, so probably there it's after 4 p.m. You can go with a beer also in parallel. It's fine. Uh, I can do it now, but it's 10 a.m. in the morning. So, um, okay, five minutes. Five minutes from now, and we we do the second part. And think about question if you have them, then we can yes. uh, answer everything at the end of the session. We will have more Q and A at the very end. Okay, five minutes from now. See you soon. I, I see a hand. Perfect. Yes, yes, check, check. Want to see more? Want to see more thumbs up? You can also clap if you want. Okay. Yay. I see one clapping. Fantastic. Okay, let's start again. Did you start the recording again, Clara? Yes? Yes, yes, yes you can go. Great. And do you see my presentation? Yes, we see it. All right, so that was my, I'm setting here 45 minutes so that we can have 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. I will go slower with certain slides and faster with others. Uh, a, a bit like the other presentations before and lectures you consider, let's say this as a collection of um, information that you can go back in time, you have all this information. So it's not really explaining everything but be aware that this is a topic that is there and sooner or later you will have to expand depending also what you are going to do in your life professional life uh, because um, uh, all these formulas and calculations you might need it you might not need it I don't know you have to decide I remember when I was at before university and I was studying maths I was like oh, why do I need to know all these formulas and then guess what? I use them every day now. Um, so actually, Elise, thank you so much because you refreshed my memory for certain formulas, which I will start using again, which is great. So, um, but why are we doing this, right? And why all of these formulas, uh, which for, if you take them just as a formula, I find them boring. But the moment I take the formula and I apply them, that is where I get excited. I'm an architect by background. I want to design buildings. I want to design better buildings. And Elise already showed you the, the why, but I want to keep uh, talking about the why. And also, um, you know, every climate, as we know, has a different need. Uh, and you, we are mixing cold climates with 
hot climates, uh, you already saw some precedents that they were swinging from different conditions. So it is not really important, the information we give you in terms of one specific climate is really the methodology that is important. Uh, take the methodology. I see a raised hand, but I wonder if there is a question or it's just a hello. If it's a hello, I, <laughs> I say hello back. If it's a question, feel free to ask. Um, so I went back to my project and I tried to get as close as possible. Uh, and I, I worked in Senegal for a couple of projects. We, we had a kind of modular um, hospital approach, which was stuck with different climates. And all these climates, they were completely different. Uh, well, not completely different, but different. And especially Dakar compared to the other was very different. So we had to build a kind of approach which was fitting with different climates um, with similar characteristics, but different in terms of details. And Elise already mentioned um, about comfort. I mean, comfort is something extremely relative. Uh, it's extremely relative from the environment where you have been raised. Uh, I'm Italian, I moved to Germany for seven years, now I'm in US and I am adapting to the climate. My first challenge when I moved in, moved in New York was humidity. I have never been in a super humid climate as New York is in August. Um, and now my threshold to humidity is completely different. I can bear humidity much more than when I was in Italy. So the first question when we were working in Senegal is what is comfort there? And if you take this tool, which you can simply Google, uh, when you have elevated air speed at 32 Celsius, if you are properly dressed, you are comfortable. You are not complying with ASHRAE. ASHRAE is the North American institution for standards, which is not mandatory, but they are saying more or less what they think it's right. And we always refer to it, probably you also refer to it in your country as a reference to high quality standards. So it doesn't comply to ASHRAE because you would never operate a building at 30 Celsius in North America. It would be perceived as too warm. But in Africa, we were talking at least with representative there and we were getting feedbacks that 30 Celsius is actually pretty good uh, in, in Senegal, at least. And, and if you look at the formulas behind uh, the PMV elevated airspeed, regardless from what ASHRAE says, we don't care, but it is actually comfortable. It's not compliant, but if you look at the metabolic balance that Elise just described, 32 Celsius at 1.52 meter per second velocity of the air, it's comfortable. So that was the principle. And we said, okay, we had to design a building which is reducing solar gains. Again, all the balances that Elise talked about, it's all about energy in, energy out. It's like your bank account, money in, money out. You always try to have more money in than money out, but that's always a balance, right? And the moment you start turning the building or opening the windows, more or less, more sun goes in and you want to have it out. So you have to play with shading, with U values. And I mean, whether you're going to calculate that or not, it's again, depending on what you will do, but you have to be aware that someone is going to calculate it and how they are going to get there. And also challenge uh, the results that whoever is going to do it for you, or if you do it, I'm going to send it back to you. Uh, and so we had different rooms in these hospitals and we were testing different orientations and see how many hours of the year you would be above 32 Celsius, which was intended as to be above 32 Celsius is not comfortable anymore. Uh, whether that is true or not, it's also a question mark because again, I have not been raised in Senegal, but the representatives living there, they felt it was fine with a ceiling fan on top of you. And what you see here is that we design a facade so climate responsive that actually there is not that much of a difference if you turn around orientation, uh, because the moment you have a properly designed shading, all the boxes all around, they behave more or less the same because in our balance, we were able to balance them 
the same way. But then once you design the envelope in terms of shading, you also start playing with materials. And Elise showed us uh, that um, chart where the dots were going down. Those bars, they are representing hours above 32 Celsius. And you see, for example, that when you bring in thermal mass with lots of natural ventilation, which is the second bar, the bar goes down. And then uh, if you reduce the thermal mass, it goes up a bit again. So we were playing again with what are the properties of the materials. And this is something that it has to go along with how good it is going to look like. The finish of my wall has to have a certain appearance from an architectonical perspective, that the touch of it, the, the, the color, but also what you have to keep in mind is that it always translates into a performance, a very bright wall. It is going to trans reflect the solar radiation onto you. It could produce glare. You would, maybe you love it, maybe you don't, but you always, there is always an environmental impact on the materials and kind of materials you use. And now I, I transfer you to Mexico. Uh, actually, it's in between Mexico and Texas. And we really wanted to study how the properties of the materials that Elise just described, they have an impact on the interior climate of a warehouse. And the idea was to have a warehouse like for Amazon or Google or whatever, although we can think whatever we want to think about these big companies. But uh, again, it really goes the mind to the, these big warehouses that they are consuming so much energy and you don't want to do that. So the question from the client um, and they, they had a printing facilities there. So that's why they wanted to build warehouses was, can I be the warehouse with no mechanical system? And if so, what is the best material? Uh, again, everything that um, Elise say, you always start with the climate and I'm sure that you have been told that many times. So study the climate, understand what are the swings in between the day and night for night flashing. Is it a heating or cooling dominated? Where is the wind blowing? What is the humidity, et cetera, et cetera. And then we really started parametrizing all these five steps, which is exactly what Elise told you. What is the R value? What should be the reflectance of the wall? What should be the thermal mass, which is density and heat capacity? What should be the moisture efficiency? And that's something else also very important. A material can absorb humidity, can release humidity, naturally. And this is something that in a very humid climate, you want to do so that the mechanical system doesn't have to do it. So we really parameterize this study. And you see the difference of the interior condition of the warehouse. If you have no thermal mass at all, you have this blue line in the background swinging up and down. And as soon as you bring thermal mass, then you have these two lines in the middle, which are really averaging the outdoor temperature. So it becomes extremely stable simply by having on one hand, just a sandwich panel, which is just insulation, basically no thermal mass. On the other end, a concrete wall. But then we said, what if instead of a concrete wall, we have a round earth wall? So we just build with mud and the mud is on the site. And you see the blue line is relative humidity with concrete and the orange is relative humidity with rammed earth walls. So again, the same principle of before, instead of swinging relative humidity up and down, it becomes almost in between, uh, very stable, simply by choosing the right material. This is why we need to understand heating, uh, balances, what is thermal mass, what is moisture buffering, all these properties which are a bit tedious uh, to understand and learn, but they have such a huge impact. And as designers, we need to be able to understand and play with those. Uh. And then of course, embodied carbon. How are all these materials reacting in terms of embodied carbon. So embodied carbon is the amount of carbon embedded into a material or embodied into a material. 
which means to produce that specific material somewhere, I produce carbon uh, in the industry, in the transportation, with my diesel truck. Uh, and this carbon is inside the material, has been produced. We need to take care of it. So in addition to the thermal and hygrometric properties of a material, you want to consider the embodied carbon of the material. EPS is super efficient as an insulation material, but also extremely carbon intense. So you want to use, for example, mineral wool or cellulose, like from your genes, you can just recycle that and transform it or upcycle it into an insulation material. And at the end of the study, we decided that this was the ideal, I don't like the word ideal, but the client loved the word ideal, so we used it, the ideal material for them to build their warehouse. A, round, a 10 centimeter exposed round earth wall with a thick layer of cellulose, so you get a bit thicker because cellulose is less efficient than EPS, but with very low embodied carbon. And then um, you need to have a certain amount of thermal mass every certain volume of warehouse because the bigger the volume, the more thermal mass you need. And then here becomes the fun part. Once you figure out the tedious part of it, how do we play with the architecture? Where do we put this material? Is this material everywhere? Is this material only on the side? Is this material just in the center? Uh, and all this has an impact on the overall environmental conditions inside. But this is where, and this is how the, the design team worked out that we as Transolar, as climate engineers, we define the boundaries of this is the material you have to use. And then the architect started playing with it uh, and saying, well, maybe we do a roof, which is this, but then we use the round earth for the shelves of the warehouse and so on and so on. And this is the result. I mean, you look at an average warehouse to the left and our warehouse in terms of operational carbon plus embodied carbon was at the right. So a 75, 80% reduction versus the business as usual. Again, my recommendation for you is, of course, you think about energy reduction, but really what we want to do for the planet is reducing carbon emissions, which is a function of energy, but it's all about carbon. It's operational carbon, the carbon emitted by operating the building and embodied carbon, the carbon emitted by constructing the building. So keep this mind in mind, this is the metric which we will use for the next decades to decarbonize our world. I suggest you to read this essay from a professor, Daniel Barbier. Um, it's called After Comfort. I always talk about it uh, when I start a project in North America, in Germany, in Europe, wherever. Professor Barber has this very interesting point of what is comfort. And as it's written here, there is an important colonial distinction. We created a world where people is more comfortable than others. And where people has more comfort than needed. If you come to North America, when outside is 100 Fahrenheit, when outside is uh, 40 Celsius, inside of a building is 21 Celsius, which is crazy. So in this essay, really, you see a total rethinking of comfort, which is very important in the way you design a building, because the moment you rethink comfort, the moment your indoor box can become actually outdoor, indoor, outdoor, something in between, something fading. You don't have a wall anymore. You have something that is fading out. And especially in your climates, sometimes they are not so nice um, that you think, do you really need a building? Do you just need the acoustic protection and the privacy protection and the rain protection or dust protection, but not really a building? Huh? So this is where a bit this idea of after comfort, this essay from this professor comes from. And really, he asks us 
where do you want to be when you build your building in a post World War II world where we thought that we had an infinite amount of energy where only certain countries developed super fast? Or do you want to be in an after comfort where really we, we have a redistribution of comfort all over the world, which is, which is what is the most concerning part of climate change is not that we are going to be warmer. Yes, it is. But it's going to be that there's going to be a reshuffle of the geopolitics of the entire planet because comfort will start lacking somewhere uh, and even more than comfort. We will start in certain part of the planets won't be livable anymore. That is the concerning part is not New York three Kelvin higher, right? So think about this thinking and uh, 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 these thoughts. Um, and now a bit of more the, the hardcore part of the second part of the lecture, which is um, what what Elise talked about, and I think also uh, your lecture number one um, was focusing on thermal energy. Thermal energy is the energy that you deliver inside your building. And uh, so if you put a hand on your fan coil or whatever is shooting cold air in summer, that energy is thermal energy. However, that energy is produced somewhere else. Again, your hand on the cold air, that is thermal energy. But then that fan coil or whatever system you have, an air conditioning, a split unit, um, has something somewhere producing that cold. And in between this something and your cold air that you're touching, there are losses. If you include these losses, then you are at site energy. Site energy is the energy that you meter in your building. Site energy is the bill that you pay. And then it will come what is called source energy, which is even the broader picture of who is generating electricity? Where is the electricity coming from? And how much electricity do I lose through the network that is delivering electricity or gas or wood? to my house, which is site energy. Uh, so now we are trying to be in between to talk about site energy and how energy is generated uh, and then distributed inside the building. So you have your beautiful envelope, you understood the materials, you kind of tackle the invisible part of your design. And then now you start adding what is more visible like your mechanical systems uh, again ask i always ask myself why am i telling why do you even care again i don't know what you're going to do i thought i would do design and i ended up doing mechanical design together with architect called design so i changed my profession at a certain point and i don't know what you will do regardless mechanical system have an impact on your design you have to have a very big drop ceiling. Uh, you have to have a fan coil at the perimeter. You have to have a PV panel on the roof. And you have to be aware because this is going to impact the environmental quality of the space you are designing. So you always keep in mind that there are three steps. Energy generation, which is your PV panel, for example, or your... Um, wind turbine then there is the energy medium which is the medium you use to move energy air very bad water that's in my opinion and refrigerant eh, something in between actually refrigerant is not great and then there is the energy delivery do you deliver it with a fan coil do you deliver it with a radiant system so Keep in mind these three steps. What you really care is step number three, because is the way the system manifests inside your house or your building or whatever. But you have to be aware also of point number one and two. And now here is when I start like flying through my presentation. It's just a collection of things. I don't want to talk too much about it, but you have to be aware. And also I'm mixing 
way of producing heating, which you might not need, or yes, in your climate, with way of producing cooling, which you might again need or not. So this is an air furnace, which is, there is a flame, there is combustion. Uh, we try to transition away from combustion. Now, this is interesting because North America is really trying to go all electric. Whereas Europe still allows for certain combustion if this combustion is defined as carbon neutral. I'm thinking to hydrogen, for example. So there are different ways. Uh, and maybe Africa is going all electric or I don't know, maybe you can help me at the end, maybe I have a question for you for the Q&A, so be ready. Um, but this is one way, you have combustion, and then you have to ask yourself, what are you burning, uh, which is making this system more or less environmentally friendly, I guess. And there is always an efficiency. So when you burn stuff, usually you lose part of the energy. Think to an engine of a car. Uh, the efficiency of this kind of um, burners is around 90%. You have a boiler, a gas boiler, again, 90%. It's very similar. In this, you warm up the air. In this, you warm up the water to do domestic hot water, for example, your shower, or to power ro your radiator. Again, 90% efficiency. And then, and then I'm stepping a bit outside of the regular little system, but it's the same thing. I mean, there is a steam turbine, uh, like my system here in New York is steam. So someone is producing steam and pulling steam into my radiators, which is super hot air, right? And you can generate that, you can generate electricity out of steam, uh, which is most of how our grid is generating electricity. And most of the time we bar coil or natural gas, rarely oil, which are very bad. And you have an efficiency of 35 to 60%. So you have a very high temperature steam and then something is, starts rotating. And out of this rotation, you have basically electricity out of it. Now you have to cool it. Uh, so you need a cooling tower, which requires water, which is very bad. So you, you don't only use natural gas or coal, but also use lots of water. Then you have a cogeneration, which is something similar to what I said before, but you also generate electricity and also heating at the same time. So you kind of don't waste that heating. You don't cool it down with a cooling tower or with water. You just reuse. And this is again for a heating climate, for a heating dominated climate. Um, and this can be fossil fueled or can be renewable, depending on, again, how do you power your cogeneration? And so that's why I go back to the steam turbine, because suddenly, if you take a steam turbine, but you use biomass, biogas, or biodiesel, this becomes 100% renewable, well, depending on the kind of biomass, but it's a bigger topic. Now, if you burn waste or you do nuclear, that is also carbon free. However, if you burn waste, there is air pollution as a big question mark. If you do nuclear, there is nuclear waste, uh, there is security. So someone could use it as a weapon in a war. So there are different opinions um, about that. Um, so always be clear that sometimes grids can be very clean uh, but also based on nuclear, uh, which is bringing something else. So depend, depending what you burn, the steam turbine can become 100% renewable. And then what we really would like to work with in the future. You have photovoltaic panels, you have wind turbine. Now, let's look at efficiency. A photovoltaic panel is extremely inefficient because it produces only 20%, takes 100% of the energy from the sun and it shoots out 20%. However, this is for free and it's going up. And wind turbines also are the second way from a cost perspective, which you really want to use. Um, more solar, 
hydroelectricity also very interesting but you need a certain geology you need a reservoir of water up and so you need to have create a kind of height in between two points so that you can create naturally electricity um, there is wood now wood can be good and can be bad and i i won't say more than that it depends on where the wood is coming from and why the wood is produced like if you have a responsibly managed forest for example and the wood comes from there so you are just taking the waste out of a forest and you burn it then that is much better than having a forest which is completely cut down uh, and this is not responsibly managed uh, so be very careful anytime we talk about food be very critical there is lots of potential that needs to be used properly then there is a solar thermal panel if a photovoltaic panel produces electricity from the sun a solar thermal panel produces water hot water so instead of using a boiler which is gas power you use a solar thermal panel however you have to put it somewhere so you need to know where you can put it usually pv you put it horizontal now like horizontal you don't see it but solar thermal has to be 45 degrees angled around depends on where you are if you are close to the equator maybe it goes again to the 60 70 it depends but there is an angle you it cannot be horizontal so suddenly you start seeing it so should the roof have an angle so that you put it there and you don't have these things sticking out this is all those are all design decisions that you as designers have to make and you need to understand the basics of how these systems are going to impact your design and then there is the magic heat pump uh, this is something you really need to understand i mean not in the physics maybe not in the thermodynamics although it's extremely interesting. Um, a heat pump is a kind of a magic um, tool because you, you know now that heat moves from, low temp from high temperature to low temperature. Huh? If you put a hand on top of a electric stove, you really perceive this heat, which is radiated onto your hand because your hand is colder than your um, electric stove. The other way around, if you are in a desert, clear sky, the sky is so cold that you start radiating energy to the sky because you are warmer than the sky. And that's why we produce ice. We were producing ice in the desert just by creating this little layer of water overnight, then in the morning would be ice, right? heat goes from higher temperature to lower temperature a heat pump is capable of doing the other way around it's capable of extracting of moving heat from a low temperature to a high temperature because of a carnot cycle which is again the thermodynamic that the heat pump you just google it if you're curious google can be a friend if you use it properly but the point being is that it's an all electric system there's no combustion and there is no inefficiency, there is a coefficient of performance which is reversed. A heat pump, if a boiler, and you will see this later, if a boiler, you need one unit of energy to move, to produce 0 0.9 energy delivered into the building. So you, you need one to have 0 0.1 in your building. In the heat pump, you do the other way around, you need one and you deliver four, four times the heating you need, you only need one electrical input to get four thermal input inside your building. And actually, this depends. It could fluctuate in between two to six, depending on the overall system. You might have heard about geothermal systems. If you start drilling piles into the ground, the ground is a big thermal battery. Suddenly, your heat pumps become extremely more efficient. However, you need to drill piles into the ground, which is costly, 
And also there is an embodied carbon into drilling piles into the ground, which you want to consider. So heat pumps are a friend. <laughs> Keep them in mind. They will be hopefully in all, all your buildings from now on. Um, and then there is how you deliver energy. So to the left, you see an all air system. If I, it's not black or white. Sometimes all air systems are great, but most of the times are not. Because the air capacity, as you now know, is one and the water capacity is four. It means that you move to move the same amount of energy, you need four times more air than what you would do with water, which means that suddenly your ducts are going to drive the space. Instead of having a big duct like this, you can have a water pipe like this. There is a big difference. And you see it to the left, you need a big drop ceiling. To the right, you don't need it anymore. Then there is refrigerant. I'm not going to talk about this slide. You can look at it, digest it. And if you have questions, come back to us. Many times you use, we use, but also you use in Africa, I think, splits units. Splits units are very cheap. You buy them at the electric store. You just screw them into the wall and they work. Beautiful. But they have refrigerant. Refrigerant is extremely dangerous for the environment. They leak. And the moment the refrigerant is out, has a global warming potential, which is much higher than everything else. It's the worst thing that we can do to the environment is using refrigerant as a energy medium. So air, you need a big duct like this. Water, you need a pipe like this. Refrigerant, you need a pipe like this. But this pipe has inside very, very dangerous material for the environment. So that's something we always have to consider. Once you have this air or fluid, water or certain refrigerant moving through your building, then you have to deliver it. How do you deliver it? You can deliver it with a fan coil. A fan coil is a, guess what? A coil with a fan. Um, so you have a fan pushing the air through a coil, and then this is cooling down or warming up your air, and this can manifest into your building in different ways. Uh, I intentionally picked very ugly pictures, so to scare you and you won't use it. <laughs> Again, fan coils can be bad or can be good. The, the point is that this fan is consuming lots of electricity and or also it's moving lots of air inside your room, which could be good or could be bad, depending on the climate. You can have an active chill beam or a passive chill beam that it's a bit, it stays in the ceiling usually, it's a sort of fan coil without a fan. So it works by passive convection. Uh, so you have it there, there's no fan, which is great, but you can still create this kind of cold air coming from the ceiling, which sometimes can be uncomfortable. Or you do it with radiant. Uh, radiant systems are maybe a bit more complicated because you don't go to the store and you buy a radiant floor. You need the you need someone who is able to assemble all the pieces which you buy at different places. However, the comfort is extremely high. Why? You know why, because we have all the formulas, right? If you, you know now what is operative temperature, which is a mixture of air and mean relative temperature, and a radiant floor or ceiling can really change that operative temperature in a very effective way. Carbon emissions, again, how is this all relating with carbon emissions? You see the gas boiler, which has a certain efficiency, what I was saying before, one unit of energy is translated in 0 0.9 unit of energy inside your building with these carbon emissions that I wrote below. If you have a heat pump, now suddenly, you have one unit of energy and you can deliver four or three units of energy inside your building. Extremely efficient. 
And if you have a geothermal system, you can even deliver six units of energy inside your building with one electric input in your source, even more efficient. Then you will have to deal with these big machines with our air handling units. As Elise said, air needs to be provided in a building uh, for air quality. You can open the window, but if outside is too cold or outside is too hot and humid, you want to pretreat the air that comes into the window. And you do it with an air handling unit. which is done by many pieces. So you take the air, you warm it up, you cool it down, you dehumidify it, you reheat it, you do whatever you want with it, and then you supply inside the space. I'm going to skip a couple of slides. There is heat recovery, which is very important in cold climates, less important in warm climates. Um, and then I want to make this, this, thing, this distinction. An air handling unit can be a big machine which is pulling air from outside to the inside, but also taking the air from the inside and recirculating it back to the inside, which would be this unit is, do, is doing is bringing outside air, but it's also providing heating and cooling by recirculating the air inside the space. This would be called an all air system, which was very common decades ago, but is using air as an energy medium, so big ducts. And then there is a kind of, in English it's called DOAS, which is a dedicated outside air, which is a small air handling unit which is only taking the air from the outside and bringing it inside. There is no recirculation and the heating and cooling into your zone is done by something else, fan coil, a chill beam, a radiant floor, it doesn't matter. It's a much smaller unit, much smaller ducts. You still have to bring a certain amount of air inside, not because of energy, but because of air quality. And here, you see the big difference of using to the left an air handling unit, which is doing both outside air and heating and cooling. You have a huge drop ceiling. To the right, you use a doors, which is a little amount of air with ceiling fans with a very high performance facade so that that amount of air, it could even be enough and you don't even need an additional system. Now, what you see is that to the left, you can only build two stories. To the right, you can build three stories. This is a huge implication from an architectonical perspective. Now, sometimes you cannot do the right one, which is like, why should I do the left one? If you are in a museum, for example, you need a lot of air. Uh, because there are many people. If you are in, you, in a theater, you need a lot of air. So you will end up to the left side of things. But if you're doing a residential, if you're doing an office, if you're doing, uh, I don't know, something that you can actually operate with a minimum amount of air, then you can build much more because you need less technical stuff in your space. And then energy storage is extremely important. When you talk about renewable, you have to store that energy because the sun is over the day, but I wanna turn on the light also overnight. And again, I'm gonna fly through it. Remember that energy storage is something that you really wanna have in your design, whether that is water or electricity, like a battery. Keep an eye on power to gas. This is extremely important and you should learn what this is. This is a kinetic energy storage, very interesting. Again, you have it as a library. Go back to this slide and be critical about how and what this is. Never forget that materials has also an impact in your building. So in my three minutes left, so that we can have some questions, 
the question is, do we really need all this stuff? Do we need the DOAs? Do we need the heat pump? Do we need a radiant floor? I don't know. That, that is something you have to answer. You have seen already projects which are the bare minimum. Uh, high tech is always overrated. We much more believe in use your technology where it makes sense. So I have a couple of projects where there's nothing of everything I said now, forget it. There was nothing, was 100% passive. This is a school in Damascus. They couldn't afford the mechanical system. And so we had to go 100% passive. You see the outside temperature, the red line, it's really swinging from day to night. Night is very cold in Damascus. The day is very warm, which are the ideal condition to have natural ventilation overnight. Again, energy balance. You pile up energy over the day and then you exhaust it overnight by natural ventilation so that your building the morning is very cold and it's a kind of battery. It's fluctuating with you. But then overnight, you have to very much ventilate it ventilated and over the day you have to reduce that solar gains in the overall energy balance. So this was the concept. Pre-cool the air naturally with trees, supply air into the building and exhaust it with a chimney. There was nothing else. There was no heat pump. There was no radiant floor, nothing. And those are the measured temperatures inside. It was passively much colder inside than outside. And this is how all these pieces, they form a shape. And you see the tectonic of everything, how things are connected one another. They are driven by design, they are driven by vision, but also they are driven by performance. Or this little school, again, there was nothing there. There was round earth, the material I talked to you about, which is absorbing humidity naturally. And then there is a chimney again, there is an earth duct so that you can use the ground as a battery, nothing in terms of mechanical systems, just pure designed energy balance. So to allow for not more than whatever, 28 Celsius inside, I don't remember. Okay. I would everybody also Elise and Clara, we would all love to receive questions. Every question we have in mind. And um, we have officially seven minutes, but we can, can go a bit longer if you have time. Any sort of question. Right, thank you, Tommaso. Um, to everyone, feel free to ask your questions, small and big questions, feel free to ask. I ask a question, let me start, but someone needs to answer. How do you provide heat? Do you think it's more important heating or cooling? And if so, how do you provide heating and cooling in your buildings? What is your experience? After this lecture, if you look around yourself, what do you see? And can someone tell me? Or show me. Friday. If you want to answer or ask a question, just um, unmute your mic and ask or answer the question. Feel free. Hello. Yes. Okay. If I I understood you correctly, you are asking how we manage how we heat or cool our space, right? Yes. Okay, so um, we have, uh, in, in Blue Way, we have a dry and hot climate. So we use 
uh, natural means, cross ventilation. Uh, we also use, I'm, I'm talking for the cooling. Mm -hmm. We also use fans and uh, we also make use of uh, the wind, the natural wind, prevailing winds that we have in our area and uh, window sizes variation to create that, uh, the pressure of the wind, like when it passes through small, smaller, um, what do you call it, area. And when it passes through a, a wider area, the pressure mm -hmm. it varies, yeah. So those are the methods that we use for cooling. And for heating, we also use uh, wall thickness. And we also vary the type of building material that we use. I will also uh, vary the type of finishings. Yes. Interesting. To keep the materials warm. So I understand it's mainly a passive approach with no too many mechanical systems? Yes, we have minimal mechanical system. And it's uh, very sustainable. Uh, and is, is that enough to create a comfortable space depending on your perception of thermal and acoustic and air quality comfort? It's not enough because uh, in some buildings, especially in the CBD, we, they actually use um, some devices, uh, what do they call them? Um, uh, like they, if they call them. Yes, 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 yes. Thank like you so split, much. Split unit. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have air conditioning units. Uh, that's what they use, that's what we use, and uh, various other technologies, but mostly it's passive. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was, this was great. Any You're other welcome. input or question um, that you have? Yes, uh, I wanted to ask, what is the difference between heat capacity and thermal capacity? So the Elise, go ahead. The difference in between thermal capacity and heat capacity. Yes, so actually it's the same kind of information. It just describes how much like the material can uh, store. But like one property is uh, in energy per kilogram of material. So it's the heat capacity. And then the other, uh, like, like joule per Kelvin per kilogram, sorry. And then the other, like the um, thermal capacity is per cubic meter. So it's joule per Kelvin per cubic meter. So actually it also take into account the fact that you have dense materials or not. Because if you look at wood and concrete, like the heat capacity of, uh, like just the heat capacity of uh, wood and concrete is not that different. But what makes a difference into inertia and like the thermal mass is that like concrete is much uh, heavy. It has a higher density. So actually in uh, thermal capacity, it will be much higher for the concrete. Okay, thank you. And always remember whenever you have a metric describing something, always think about this metric with a unit of metric together. Uh, never forget that. So this is what Elise just did. And I think it's very important for you just to remember what that is, because if you look at a unit of metric, you can deduce more or less what a metric is, like heat capacity and so on.
Okay. So if there are no other questions, um, we can adjourn, Clara, or? Yes, I think so. I was just waiting maybe one more minute if somebody else, somebody else yeah. has one more question. We hear some voices. Maybe a question. Maybe a question. Doesn't seem like a question. Okay. Um, then I think we can really come to an end. No, no a question. Yeah, hello. Hi, how are you? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I guess you have a question for us. Yes. Great. On the first part of the lecture, when we're talking about parameters for thermal comfort, yeah, you mentioned something about the shivering mechanism to counterbalance heat loss from the body by exothermal reaction. So my question is, how does that happen? How does it function to counterbalance heat loss by shivering? So thank you for your question. So I'm not a biophysiologist expert, but the idea is just that what happens in your body is that when you're too cold, you have like less blood circulating in your body. And so if you start shivering, then you also have like muscles that are activating kind of uh, Continuously by your body. And so this activation helps to try to deliver more blood into like your body. So that's why you try to, like you, you feel, a, like you notice when you're shivering that like you're too cold, but by shivering, you already try to like uh, adapt and have a better comfort feeling into the body. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. Somebody else? Okay. Then um, I think we are done. I thank you all, especially to Mazo and Elise for giving this lecture and all the participants. Thanks a lot. You will receive the lecture soon uh, by email. And if any other question comes to your mind, feel free to approach Tomaso and Elise or uh, me as well. Okay. Hello. 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 Aha. There is another question. Oh, it's not a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe you can share with us your, the book you're using. The book we are using. You mean the presentation we're using yes 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 i will i will you should have received already okay. the previous two lectures and you will receive of course also that one all right thank you thank you then um have a nice evening have a nice weekend to everybody and see you next week good luck with thank everything you, guys and people Bye. thank you Hello. thank you everyone